It's a cosmic cocktail party somewhere in the galaxy. DA. The mothership is right now hovering above your city. Beat me up on the mamas of all mama shit. Hey, I'm looking through my telescope and I see a mothership. Is that you? Beat me up. Hey, DA, I'm thirsty, man. Can you beat me up for a cold one? Hey, DA, what's going on, baby? Stop me off and beat me up. DA, what's the deal? Oh, permission to get in that mothership. Is my window seat still available? Beat me up. What's going on, DA? Hey, man, I need you to do me a huge favor. My co workers at church. So just beat me up, man. Get beamed up. Everyone else has. It's DA on CBS Sports Radio. Happy Tuesday to you, North America. We come to you live from the O'Reilly Auto Parts studios. O'Reilly, better parts, better prices every day. Thanks for dropping on by and spending some time with us. We remind you we're available on iTunes as well and SoundCloud. Full show podcast. Full show podcast. No commercials are available after each and every show. As soon as we are off the air, we upload that for you. So you can go to our Twitter page or Facebook page to see the direct links right there. That's Twitter. DA on CBS is the handle. On Facebook, it's Facebook.com slash the DA show. Google, Yahoo, Facebook, Twitter. About an hour from now, talented Sarah Kustak is going to join us. She works pregame, postgame sidelines for the Yes Network on Brooklyn Nets broadcast. A lot of news with the Brooklyn Nets, could be being sold. Also, the Kevin Garnett headbutt. Are they sellers or buyers as we make our way through the season? We'll also get her thoughts on the rest of the NBA as well in the Eastern Conference. So she's going to join us in studio coming up here in about an hour from now. We'll also go up to Oregon coming up later on to the show. Steve Tannen's going to join us from our affiliate 95.3, the score in Eugene, to describe what's next for the Ducks after they got humiliated Last night, a lot to get to here on the show. We'll get back to your phone calls momentarily. But first, at the top of this hour, we always bring you the best audio of the day. Yeah, um, is this thing on? Hello? Sound. Audio vibrations transmitted through the airwaves. And sometimes it's epic. We're talking about practice. We couldn't do diddly, poo. You play to win the game. If you call me Chris Everett to my face one more time. I already did it twice. You better. I bet I do. Effective immediately. I am banning Mr. Sterling for life. If you want to crown them, then crown their ass. But they are who we thought they were. The day's best audio. It's DA Sound Check. We start with Gary Danielson, who you just heard as part of the update here on CBS Sports Radio. He was on our affiliate in Charlotte, WFNZ 610. The Mac Attack, Chris McLean and Jim Selene. And is it possible that with that effort last night, Marcus Mariota is not the number one pick in the draft? I think it's very uh, possible that Mariota's going to slip out of the first round now. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. He struggles mm-hmm. from the pocket. He's slender build. Uh, spread quarterbacks have not done well. But if I'm an NFL team, especially if I'm Tampa now, it scares me, uh, his off-field thing. I get that. Yeah. But the way he plays on the field and the problems Tampa has putting fans in there, uh, I think I still got to take uh, Jameis. I mean, I love Gary Danielson, but that I, I disagree with about everything he just said there. Number one, you're never drafting a guy to put fans in the seats in the NFL. That's not where your money comes from. Your money comes from the TV money. And the TV money is shared. It doesn't matter how many times you're on Monday Night Football or Sunday Night Football. You're getting monster national television deals. So the Buccaneers don't have to worry about drafting Jameis Winston to go fill up seats. You want to know why that doesn't work? The Jacksonville Jaguars ignored Tim Tebow for how many seasons? Put a pool in your stadium. That's how you get people there. You don't have to worry about that stuff. That's not what franchises worry about. At least not good ones. I mean, hell, the Atlanta Falcons are actively pricing out everybody in their in their city. $45,000 for a PSL to a team that's never won a Super Bowl? Barely ever gets to an NFC Championship game? You're not worrying about selling tickets. Number two, Marcus Mariota dropped out of the first round with that game? Uh, now, if Danielson wants to say he dropped out of the top spot, or maybe even the top five, or even the top ten. This is a league 
where Blaine Gabbert, where Jake Locker, where Christian Ponder were top 15 picks. Well, DA, general managers learned their lesson. No, they didn't. They keep reaching for these guys each and every year, man. Manziel had way more questions than Marcus Mariota. Way more. Where did he get picked? 22. You, you're telling me that Marcus Mariota is going to drop out of the first round based on one football game? Going into that game, you're telling me that a guy based on one football game can go from the number one pick to out of the top 32? That's insane. And that's not true. What's going to happen? I'm, look, we've lived this a thousand times over. Marcus Mariota is going to go through a controlled environment for his professional workout, his workout day, and perform well, right? I mean, it's going to be very obvious he's going to play with a lot of his own wide receivers, if not all of his own wide receivers. Controlled environment. They're going to script out the whole thing. He's going to he's going to look fine. More than that, he's going to interview brilliantly with everybody, right? Hard worker, good head on his shoulders, very coachable. I mean, listen to what Mark Helfrich had to say about him after the game last night. What did you think about, you know, what Marcus Mariota left behind? Helfrich basically said this guy was an angel without wings. You know, that there was basically nothing I asked him to do that he didn't do. He was incredible for the team. I mean, he couldn't lavish enough praise. So do you think when he when Marcus Mariota walks in to, I don't know, 20 different NFL teams that might want to interview him, he's going to look like a buffoon? Of course not. He's going to nail it. Absolutely nail it. And in a quarterback starved league, let me ask you this. Let's check this thing right now. As the music runs, NFL draft order 2015. I'm going to tell you exactly where Marcus Merritt is not dropping past, okay? You ready for this? Out of the top, out of the first round. Are you kidding me? He is going to go before 21. He will not slip anywhere past 20. I can guarantee you this right now. Mraz, you know who drafts at number 20? Chip Kelly and the Philadelphia Eagles. You think Chip Kelly at number 20 is going to pass on Marcus Mariota at 20? Me personally, I'm not convinced Chip Kelly isn't trading up at that point to go get Mariota too. If he's falling out of that top 10, couldn't you see Chip sliding up to get his guy? Absolutely. Look at the teams that could... The Kansas City Chiefs at number 18. At number 18, yes, they have Alex Smith. But they haven't won a playoff game with somebody who's actually been drafted by that team and developed, I think, since Len Dawson. The Browns pick at 19. Could they be back in the hunt for a quarterback? The Eagles at 20. The Bengals have one more year of Andy Dalton at 22. The Arizona Cardinals are at 24. I know you got Carson Palmer there, but look at what a disaster that was once Palmer went down, and he's clearly not in the the middle of the prime of his career anymore. The idea. Two glaring ones you missed. Texans at 16? And how about the New Orleans Saints at 13? All that talk that Drew Brees could be done? How about letting Mariota groom on the Brees for a year or two? You think Bill O'Brien's not going to take Marcus Mariota at number 16 if he stays at 16? He will snap him up automatically. Come on. I mean, I like Danielson, but that... None of that quote makes sense. Again, did, last night Mariota did not look good. Mariota seemed overwhelmed. He couldn't move the he couldn't move the offense. You could certainly say, look, he's a scheme guy. But the fact is, you have to have a quarterback in this league to do anything, to do anything, to achieve anything. And you have a guy that was the presumed number one pick going into the game, slipping out of the first round based on one sixty minute football game, when you know he's going to nail the inter. He's not going to smoke crack this offseason, all right? He's not going to hold up a bank. There's no way he slips out, of, slips out of the top round. There's no way. Number two, Jason LaConfora, CBS Sports Insider, NFL-wise, was on with Gio and Jones, our morning show here on CBS Sports Radio. And his guess is the Peyton Manning career is done. I don't think he'll be back. Um, I don't think he's a guy who at the end wants to be remembered for hanging on too long, for being a game manager uh, who stuck around another year to try to get 70,000 passing yards and break a bunch of records um, and put his body through all that again, knowing that he's going to peak sometime in October and that the second half of the year could be really ugly. 
I think it's, look, Lock and Fora nails a lot of this stuff, and he's got great connections, and I always love having him on the show, so I wouldn't doubt anything that Lock and Fora reports. I definitely believe that Peyton Manning is weighing this thing hard because he's at he's going to be 39 by the time the draft rolls around. He'll be 39 next football season, and he's now dealt with the neck injury and the surgery and now a torn quad, and he has to he has to feel like, you know, a 16-game schedule is beating me up, and I'm only in this to win Super Bowls. I'm not in this to get to the playoffs or just to keep playing or for the money. So unless I can win Super Bowls, that means i got to be healthy in January and February. It's not worth it. So I'm sure he's taking time to really weigh this, but I just got a hard time believing he's going to walk away simply because he's still really effective when he's healthy. I mean, last year he was healthy for 16 weeks in the, the, the playoffs. He had the best season ever for a quarterback. Do you really walk out like that when that's so so recently? Just my gut, I think he comes back. And I think he has every reason to want to come back if he does because he can still get it done when he's healthy. And finally, speaking of which, his general manager, John Elway, begins his press conference as only John Elway could. Good afternoon. Uh... I'd like to start out this uh, press conference with uh, a thank you to John Elway, or John Elway, uh, John Fox. We did not agree uh, on how to get to the next step. That's so Elway. Look, Elway's the golden boy in Denver. He was the golden boy at Stanford. He won a couple of Super Bowls, went to five of them. He's considered one of the great quarterbacks of all time. Now he's a CEO and slat of a million different businesses around the Denver area. He's running the Broncos. They're winning the division every year. He's firing coaches. He's signing free agents. You know what? John Elway is like, you guys wouldn't be here without me. So I just want to start this by thanking John Elway. Wait a second. I'm John Elway. I mean, everybody else. Who is that guy that I just fired? Uh, the John, uh, you know, what was that guy? John Wolf. John, John Fox. John Fox. Also, how breathy was Elway? What? What? Did Elway just get done doing his run through the stadium? Can I play that one more time? He's like, <gasps> good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start out this uh, <laughs> press conference with uh, a thank you to John Elway. Or John Elway. Uh, John Fox. You know, because Elway always does the thing where he's got the suit jacket on and then he puts his two thumbs into his belt buckle right here, right around his waist. And he always puffs out the chest. He's like, ah. He always does that thing, and that's what he's doing right there, I'm sure. <sighs> I just want to think that uh, John Elway guy. I mean, I'm, I'm John Elway, the, the other guy, the, the schmuck we just hired. I mean, John Fox. I want to. That's his name, right? John Fox. <sighs> Good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to start out this. Uh, Press conference with uh, a thank you to John Elway or John Elway, uh, John Fox. Oh boy, I always we- do that. He's so breathy. That's your sound check. Eight five five two one two. Steve is something else here. <laughs> Yesterday he's fading in and out. This he just cuts off the pod. He's got a real quick trigger when he fades out the music, man. He still hasn't gotten a feel for the show no here. Boy. What was that? That's a real. You slammed I'm still, on the- Well, I'm trying to figure this out. You know, the cold open, I got to slam right out of. This one, I guess I can't slam out of. I just have no, to fade go, out go. of. He gives you that. That's your sound check. Fade out of it nicely. Feather the break there. Feather Should the break. Should we try this again? <laughs> and that's your sound check. That's Better? nice. That's okay. nice. It's not so abrupt. Okay. Soft touch. He's got to figure this He's out, just, man. Just feather the brake there, Steve. <laughs> we might have to send him back to the AHL at some point. <laughs> you just slam the brakes on, screeching halt. Next segment. Move on, DA. And his excuse would be, listen, I worked on the Mojo show here in this time slot. <laughs> 855-212-4CBS. David's in Buffalo. He's on 1270. What's up, Dave? Hey, uh, D.A., thanks for taking my call, man. Uh, got it. Just want to jump in here and uh, talk about Rex Ryan coming to Buffalo. Uh, I think it's an interesting move because, obviously, he's got uh, you know good history around the division. He had some success. Um, the thing I'm most concerned about is what he's going to do with the offense. Um, I'm not worried about the defense. There's a lot of good uh, players on defense here that can get after the quarterback. Um, I think Kiko Alonso is going to come back next year. Um, I think our secondary is okay. I mean, it's not great, but I think with a good pass rush, 
that covers things up. But I really, you know, to me, I'm wondering, you know, looking at that quarterback from Ohio State last night, I mean, if he's going to come out and I'm here in second, third round, Bills don't have a first-round pick. I mean, is that a guy that Rex Ryan and this new regime might say, hey, this is a guy we got to take a shot at because he looks like a, you know, a guy who could be a pretty good quarterback at the next level? Well, I think the fact is, David, you touched on something very important. The Buffalo Bills have talent in a lot of different areas. They do not have a quarterback right now, at least through the vision of last year's regime and Doug Marone. I mean, they drafted E.J. Manuel in the first round, and by October 1 of his second year, they already kind of threw him to the wolves and, and said, it's over. So that tells you something about how the previous regime looked at E.J. Manuel. Now, he's still really young. He's still got a lot of, I think, athleticism, and you have to wonder if, you know, the next coach comes in there. He's certainly not a, he's certainly not completely busted already in his career, but the Buffalo Bills have to establish and assess their quarterback position before they get to the draft with E.J. Manuel because if they don't have to spend a high-round pick on a quarterback, then don't because you're already losing this year's pick because of the Sammy Watkins trade. So I think the next guy, and I agree, Rex Ryan, he's an emotional guy. He wins press conferences. He's got a lot of confidence. He knows defense. He was never able to fix the offense in New York. And you have to hope that with a strong offensive coordinator and the right quarterback, Rex doesn't have to because that was always his bugaboo with the Jets. Every single year, he had no answer for the offense. CBS Sports Radio. Wants you to know that the mothership has landed. It's DA on CBS Sports Radio. DA, what's going on? First thing first, I am in need of a trip, so permission to board that sweet mothership. Put a glide in your stride and a dip in your hip and come on down to the mothership. DA, greetings from Canada. Permission to board. How's it going, DA? Permission to board that big old mother thing. What's up, my brother? I'm doing good. It's been a while since I called, but I want permission to come aboard the mother Asking permission to join a sports talk spaceship? Well, we're all a little crazy. The mothership has connected. Permission to go to the second floor. Me and my dog, Elvis, we got to get over that ship. I was at the Department of Flying Vehicles. Permission to board the ship. Permission to come aboard the mothership. Permission to come aboard. Yeah, beat me up. Let me come aboard that mothership. The mothership, the, the, the mothership. Connected. Welcome inside a Tuesday evening edition of the DA Show, everybody. Thanks for joining us across North America, not only in the States, but also north of the border as well on nearly 160 affiliates. We are here 6 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time and then 3 to 7 Pacific. We come to you live from the O'Reilly Auto Parts studios. O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day. So we'll get back to your phone calls at 855 212 cbs 855-212-4227. Of course, you can always connect with us on Twitter as well, DA, on CBS. So for those that are kind of tuning in or getting new to the show, we have recently switched time slots. We were on the overnight show for two years here on CBS Sports Radio. And when you're doing the overnights, basically the only people that are up with you are the people that you work with or that are working at that same time listening. And so we were a very closed office around here. We would come in and it was great. No bosses to be around. No bosses listening. No bosses to tell us what not to do. And that was great because we got away with murder basically every night. The problem is you can never have a guest in studio because they're always sleeping. But that has all changed. Our first in Well, I take that back. We did have one in-studio guest, Merez. 4.20 a.m. 4.20 a.m. on July the 4th or right around there, 2013. We had Badlands Booker, competitive eater, come in to do the hot dog eating challenge with you in advance of the 4th of July. Yeah, in studio slugging 30 hot dogs at 4 in the morning. It was quite the spot. And he used the the raspberry Gatorade or the cherry Gatorade, I don't forget. It was the fruit punch fruit Gatorade, punch. and it just it made me queasy. Yeah, there is no raspberry Gatorade. That's disrespectful to food. I'm it, sorry. Look, the whole thing was disrespectful, I think, to the radio industry as well. But this has all changed because now we are actually on when people are awake 
And we welcome on our first in-studio guest in the new time slot, Sarah Kustak from the Yes Network. She covers the Brooklyn Nets, among other things, and she joins us here on the show. Sarah, how are you? I'm honored. This is big. I was honored prior to this, this but now big. that I hear, I'm the first Almost the first guest. Pretty much the first. Are, is there any food eating contest involved tonight or no? Look, there's. We just had a. We had a box of Tostitos and cheese <laughs> cheese queso come Salsa? through. Okay. So if you want, if to, you want to eat, Sarah, we'll eat. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't tempt Mraz because he will definitely go down that road. Okay. So this is really cool though. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And we always have you guys on here in the studio watching the Nets coverage, etc. And what an interesting kind of season this has been for the Nets because you come off last season. After the Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett editions. And then this year, you kind of don't know what's going on yet. The Jason Kidd defection. And then are they going to be good again? Are they are they buyers? Are they sellers? Has to be kind of a weird season for you so far. The interesting is a good way to put it. Yeah, I think very it's interesting. A, it's a polite way to put it. Um, in, in every year since the move to Brooklyn, I feel like there has kind of been this feeling out process. Yeah. And, and we see it again this year. Unfortunately, I think the guys like Darren Williams, Joe Johnson, I think they're sick of the feeling out process. I yeah. think they're ready to have some consistency. Um, but but it's been tough. And, and they're up against a tough stretch now as, as they face a very difficult schedule. They've obviously been struggling lately. So it, it, it's been interesting, to say the least. Got the Wizards coming in on Saturday night. Mm-hmm. And so Paul Pierce comes with. And that's going to be interesting just because even though he wasn't here long, it is kind of a, is. a homecoming of sorts. It is, it is, the dynamic of, of all that. How, you know, he'll be playing against Kevin Garnett. Hopefully he doesn't get any more suspensions. No more, right, no more right. headbutting yeah, from, exactly. from KG. <laughs> um, but, but it will. And, you know, Jason Terry, I know he was there just a small piece of that, but part of that – you know, big Boston trade he was in just last night um, with Houston, and, and he talked about the surprises and the changes. I, I think it's just a matter of, of the Knits trying to find their footing, find their identity, what type of team they're going to be. But but with all the changes, it's been hard to really um, grasp onto anything. So you have a very interesting and really cool and unique perspective on Kevin Garnett because you're courtside all the time. Yes. So I worked in Boston, and... In Boston, when KG was there, the people that were around that arena every night said his trash talk was as creative and as unique and as kind of special, quote unquote, air quotes, as you are going to get in the league. When you are down on the floor and you get to hear KG do this stuff live, what is it like? I, I want to cover my ears. <laughs> yeah. Half of it, I'm like, I don't think I should be hearing this. My ears! It, it is, though, but that, that's that been a part of his game I think since he came into the league, I mean, 20 years ago, it's obviously, I'm sure, developed. Um, But just the things that he comes up with and says, but but that's what he is. He wants to get under guys' skin. We've seen it year after year. Um, And and now, you know, just the latest with with Dwight Howard, the headbutting. But but he really does. That's all a part of who he is. He's one of the most just fascinating people to be around both on and off the court. But but that is just a part of his the emotion, the passion that he plays with, that he thinks the game. Um, But it is eye-popping. And and as you said, it's some of the stuff. It's like, gosh, I I don't think I should ever hear this in a lifetime. (laughs) He's fascinating because he's wildly intelligent. Yes. Okay, he's one of the smarter – forget just basketball IQ. He's a smart guy. Yes. If you just gave him a written word test of some sort, he would crush almost everybody else on the court. He's just really bright. And he's also a guy that hates the limelight, right? Goes home does not come out of his condo or his house. He was never around the nightlife in Boston, and that's just not who – Timberwolves, not that type of guy, right? So basketball is his thing, hyper intense. And so what you see is totally genuine, right? Yes. Like I mean, that's when who you, he when is. You, it, I, even, for example, last night after the headbutting and he's walking up the court and he's shaking his hands and he's, you know, got his – that's him. I mean, he he can't contain that because that is is truly how intense he is, and he'll get that way in in a normal conversation. I mean, we'll be on the bus talking about soccer, and and that's that's what he will really dig into. And it's just, as you said, it's incredible to see how intelligent he is on so many topics, um, on you know politics and socially. And he really is just someone who it's not just him. The basketball player, he really ha- it runs the gamut of, of things that he is passionate about. And um, it's certainly been fun to be around him. Which is wild also because he never went to college. No. And so this was a guy that jumped right out of high school. No. So you would think kind of stunted development, stunted education, et no. cetera. 
He doesn't come off that way as, no, at all. No. And you say in terms of like shying away from the limelight, we've noticed that. And as media members, you want a guy like that to talk every single day. But it's stuff over over Christmas. He took his daughter and, and no one, you know, no one highlighted this. No one found out about it. It wasn't a press release to, to hand out presents to, to underprivileged kids. And he gives money away. And he I mean, he does so much for the communities. I know he did, especially when he was in Minnesota. But he doesn't want he doesn't want any of, you know, the past doesn't on the like back. cameras. No. And it's not about that for him. So is it intimidating to ask guys like that questions because he is so intense and he oftentimes come off, he comes off as angry. And But you're trying to get to a spot where you can kind of get him to open up a little bit, and that's always a little hard when he's in the heat of the moment after a game, passionate, however. Is that intimidating to try to get him to open up? I think the one thing in, in – with Garnett specifically, he he's very thoughtful. I, I don't know, you know, how much our listeners or, or you watch in a post game press conference, for example, or pregame. Every question that's asked, he he'll think yeah. before he speaks, and he's also very respectful. For as much as we could laugh about his trash talking, his his curse words, how you know whatever he does, he's very respectful to people, to the media, um, and, and that's why I respect him so much as a professional because he understands everyone has a job to do. So he's not trying to to take off anyone's head. He's not trying to be rude, and so that's why I think it really is. Um, you embrace working with him and understanding the kind of person he is because because he does try and give you what you need and, and try to express himself. It just comes out in a very, very intense manner. Very intense <laughs> manner. Sarah Kusta covers the Nets for the Yes Network. She joins us here on CBS Sports Radio and Studio. Let me ask you about Jason Kidd because he only was there one year and then the way that he leaves is really awkward. And is there bitter feelings or does everybody just kind of feel like that's business? And I, let's separate that players from management because I imagine management very upset but I, how do the players feel I, about I it? I think it's that is two very separate distinctions and, and I'm glad you bring that up because I think we were all kind of curious about it and where you know it, it was most evident was when Milwaukee uh, mid-November was coming back to play Brooklyn so right. that, that's the opportunity to ask guys like Joe Johnson Kevin Garnett I know Paul Pierce spoke about it to, to some of the media when he was in to play the Knicks Darren Williams and it was amazing how much the players um, said that that no hard feelings. They were happy for him. They mm. understand that that you know, unlike sometimes the way fans perceive things, that this is a business, mm. and and sometimes you make business decisions, and they wanted the best for him. And it, and it didn't seem like just the the politically correct thing to say. They they seem to honestly feel that way. Um, before the game, after the game, we saw you know kid talking with with the different guys and having long conversations with Garnett afterwards, and and so to me that says what the response was and in what you know just the way in which they accepted it, and and now it seems as though everyone has moved on. Did people sense friction between Jason Kidd and the front office or Jason Kidd in ownership last year? Because I think for a lot of Nets fans, it came out of nowhere. It, it did, and and I think as you know as that happened, as the story unfolded, it obviously more came out about just maybe differences in. In, in the big picture plan and in what they were looking at moving forward. When when that um, started to come out, I think then people, you know, maybe saw both sides of it. I, I think it's one of those things where it's a very complicated situation. I think there's always two sides of the story. Um, but it, at the end of the day, I think, you know, the, the Nets do have a very um, – a very solid coach in Lionel Hollins. I think they're very happy with with what you know they have in him and in the stability they have in him. And I think you know obviously Jason Kidd has has done really well and surprised a lot of people with the Bucks this season. So I think that's just kind of the direction things have headed. What a bizarre season it has been, specifically in the Eastern Conference. When you look at the standings and you see the Atlanta Hawks at the one seed, right, and you see well the Wizards made that run last year and then they add Paul Pierce, but they're in the top three. You see the Knicks near the cellar. You don't know about the Cleveland Cavaliers. You have a lot of new bodies and names and teams. Toronto's the two. Milwaukee's the five. How bizarre is it to kind of look at these topsy-turvy Eastern Conference standings every night? Yeah, well, I think the the crazy thing is last year, you know, the the line was, well, the East is so bad, you, you could still hang around, right. even with the, with the Nets or the Knicks. Tough starts, but it, it's even worse 
this year, it seems. But I think the, the biggest surprise has been the Atlanta Hawks because they don't have any big stars on their team. Mm-hmm. And they have just played such incredible team basketball. But the stretch that they've run off, um, you know, Cleveland, they're still coming around. LeBron James, uh, you know, the big story tonight is that he does return to the lineup after missing the last eight games. Right. How he's continuing to, to find his role with that team, with Kevin Love, Kyrie Irving, um, David Blatt, you know, with, as their new head coach. There's a lot of different teams that are making moves. And, and you mentioned it, Toronto. I think the expectation was that they would have another good year. Milwaukee, no one expected them to be where they're Especially at. Especially at Jabari. Exactly. And, and they've lost some players. I think the Knicks, you know, as you mentioned, maybe they weren't expected to be very good this year. But, a, but not this shock. bad. I My mean, God, what a fire shock. that is. Um, you know, five wins, that's that's pretty brutal. So, and, and even with the Nets now, I mean, they're in a position where they're in the eighth spot of the Eastern Conference, and, and Charlotte's coming, Detroit's coming. Those teams are playing better. So, you know, it, it really is a free-for-all at this point. Give me your thoughts on the Cleveland Cavaliers now that LeBron is there. They've been a work in progress all season long. They've looked really good in spurts. They've looked really bad in spurts. And hard to imagine we're already now second week of January. They're still 500 what was the sense that you've gotten watching them this year up close? They they've been horrific on defense, and I think that you know has put them in a tough spot in a lot of cases. Uh, you look back to when LeBron and, and the big three when they went down to Miami, it took some time. So I right. think LeBron at least knew this was going to take some time. But but there's been a lot of reports, and I you know not around them every day, so you don't know. But about him trying to mesh with Kevin Love, Kyrie Irving, where does he fit in? Um, who's really running the offense. And I think that's still questions to be answered with the trades with J.R. Smith there now and with Iman Shumpert. How do they fit in with LeBron back? Because they haven't been in the lineup since um, since he's been out. Uh, David Blatt also is a new head coach. I mean, they just really have a lot of question marks of, of newness to the team that you wonder can they figure out. And now, as you mentioned, at this point in the season, can they find themselves to make sure they maintain one of those top four spots um, for the playoffs? But, I, you know, I think it's just a work in progress. they got a ton of talent. When you got a guy like LeBron James – in the playoffs, when you're talking a best of seven, I mean, you'd like to bank that he can win you at least two to three games in yeah. a series. So I think things obviously change when you get to the postseason. But um, with them, it'll be interesting to see what direction they continue to head as the season goes on. What's funny, you mentioned the top four seeds. I mean, the Cavaliers could really be any seed in the Eastern Conference, and you you might pick them to win every series, yeah. right? Just depending on how they are fitting together at that point in time. Like, if there was a 1-8 seed, a 1-8 <laughs> matchup, and it was the Hawks versus the Cavs, and the you, Cavs were the 8, yeah. you might take the Cavs. You might. You might. And and that's what makes, you know, them just such a uh, just potent team, is anytime you have LeBron James in your lineup. And, again, you go through, um, they they get Mozgov, they, they get the big 7-1 center to, to kind of bolster um, their inside and their front court uh, with the loss of Verjao. So th- there's a lot of different things that you wonder about them. But when you actually just look on paper, and I know the game's not playing, on paper, but with that roster, you like to think that they have a chance against anyone. I want to ask you about LeBron and some of the other superstars, future Hall of Famers, how they kind of carry themselves on a daily basis since you're up close and personal with them. We'll do that coming up next. Sarah Kustak joins us. She covered the Nats for the Yes Network. She joins us here in studio on CBS Sports Radio. We'll come back with that and a lot more about the NBA next. DA, CBS Sports Radio. New time slot, same mothership. Hey, man, congratulations. You're moving up like the Jeffersons. Oh, and I'm sorry. Please beam me up. <laughs> DA on CBS Sports Radio. 24 minutes past the hour. DA with you on the ever-expanding CBS Sports Radio Network. We thank you for being with us. And joining us in studio this hour is Sarah Kustak from the Yes Network, she covered the Brooklyn Nets, and actually a former athlete in her own right. You played not only high school volleyball and basketball, but also you played for the DePaul Lady Blue Demons. Yes. College it's basketball. Getting, it's getting farther and farther away, though. Are they Lady Blue Demons? Uh, just Blue Demons. Just Blue Demons? I never but, know that. I know. just No, just Blue Demons. So you played all four years at DePaul. All four years at DePaul. And I you was actually, an assistant coach there for a little while that's before right. I got into this crazy, crazy TV media business. You were captain junior and senior year as well in DePaul, yeah. at DePaul. And uh, you guys made the tournament, right, a couple we times? We did. We did. So that's a, a big times, deal. The very big deal. Um, the farthest we ever got when I was playing was the second round. We made it to the second round a couple times. 
um, when I was an assistant there. We made it to the Sweet 16. They're doing well. They're having a good season. Yeah. They're having a good season. They they fell out of that a couple losses, so they fell out of the top 25. But, you know, I still support. I still keep tabs. Still keep tabs on my Blue Demons. Well, women's basketball is so interesting because, you know, they're – in in men's basketball, we always talk about Kentucky and Kansas and, and those types of teams. But when it comes to women's basketball, it's almost worse because UConn and Tennessee and then, you know, you throw in a Duke or Louisiana Tech, they're Stanford. There's not a lot of room for a lot of other power players. There's until this season. It's perfect. You bring it. South Carolina has been number one now for quite some time. And it's crazy because this is the lo- first time I can remember in a long time that UConn yeah. hasn't hasn't been in and they're still right up there in the top uh top 5. But yeah, but it it has been that way for a while. Now so, how did that happen? Just all the great recruiting talent just keeps going to the same schools? Uh I think so. I think you know with with women's basketball, I think you get used to hearing about the schools that are so good. Gina Oriema, of course, Pat Summit, yeah. you know, that before at, at Tennessee, um, but I think you know young young girls that watch and and even when you look at you know TV and now it's starting to expand the women's basketball coverage. But right. but early on, and I want to say back in my day, but back, back in, in my day. back in my day, you know there there wasn't a ton of games televised. So the games that you were seeing, right, were the UConns, the Tennessees, um, you know Stanford's, Dukes, a, mm-hmm. a lot of those top teams, and I think. As a young player, that just then becomes the schools you root for and where you want to go. But you grew up in Illinois, so that was kind of a hometown team for you. Yep. And then did you grow up rooting for all the Chicago teams? I did. I did. Because then you ended up working at and Comcast Sports at Chicago. So I covered then all so the Chicago perfect. teams. And I, I don't want to say that that kind of took away me being a fan, um, but but I think, as you know, when you start covering teams and covering sports. It's hard. It, it, hard you, to it remain becomes, still a fan. Yeah, you, you kind of lose that fan, and it becomes more – uh, of a job and, and you see different things about teams and um, you know and I still love those teams but you know me being a Bulls fan as a kid growing up watching Michael and Scotty yeah. uh, it, it changes it changes and then all of a sudden when you're covering a different team like the Brooklyn Nets you you know just by virtue of I like to go into a winning locker room yeah, right. <laughs> so you start to root for them so you were a kid and Michael and Scotty and they're winning championships oh, that was and it. then is the entire city just Bulls central at that point yes absolutely it's all about the Bulls because that's I was junior high high school yeah. during that stretch yeah and oh that's all you cared about You're did a- you did you rock your own jer- jordan jersey yes you did yes but i have to say the one jersey i wore most uh which totally flies in the face of everything is a dan marino jersey is that right yeah you yeah. had a marino jersey for some reason i think because everyone you know the the bears and the 85 super bowl and all everyone loved the bears and for some reason i wanted to be different and i liked i like dan marino i think i like the dolphins colors. well i was gonna honest. say it, it's a very attractive color scheme for any young person because you have kind of a flying mammal fish on your yes. helmet or on your sleeve it's teal slash aqua it's white and orange i mean the, the yeah. whole the, the look back in the 80s that was kind of the, <laughs> the, the most those were the colors the most badass look there was <laughs> then once you get into like when i was in high school i'm a little bit older than you were like Eighth grade, ninth grade, Charlotte Hornets, huge. Oh, yeah. Because yes. you had the teal and the purple with the Hornet, and if you didn't have an LJ jersey or a Hornet starters jacket, man, you were not cool. That was, I think, that too. I mean, it became a dream of mine, and then now I tease him. Kendall Gill uh-huh. um, worked was our studio analyst for the Bulls, and I remember having a Kendall Gill Charlotte Hornets poster. Is that right? Yes, oh, up wow. in the basement. And so I told him <laughs> that, and I think he gave him a big head. So I was like, "All right, Kendall, that's that's the last time I'm going to talk about the that's the fantastic. Hornets poster." He had a great high top fade back in the day. Yeah, great fade, great fade. So you're around all these superstars, megastars, guys like LeBron, and I wonder. If you didn't have your job the way that it was and you were just kind of a fan, you didn't know anything about sports, and you came across LeBron or you came across Kevin Garnett, would they strike you in a different way than the normal athlete, the normal basketball player? Do they have a certain aura around them? Yes, absolutely. Yeah? Definitely a presence. And I think they all, and and I'm not sure you go, you know, if you want to go superstar by superstar, I think they're all different. You know, you look at a LeBron James and Kevin Garnett as opposed to a Kevin Durant or Derrick Rose, for example. I mean, everyone has different personalities. Uh LeBron James, though, just to me, in, in a Kevin Garnett, larger than life. Paul Pierce is always the same way yeah. um, because they have they do have so much charisma, so much charm. And, and I don't know if that's because they've had the limelight on them for some such a young age. Uh, but they really are people that when you listen to them, they, everyone gravitates toward them. But I, I've always been impressed with the manner in which they handle themselves, with how they treat people. I was covering the Bulls. Cleveland Cavaliers series back when the, the first run of LeBron James it was a playoff series 
and this was had to be in 2011, I think, 2010, 20. And I'll never forget how impressed I was walking, you know, running around the arena and, and doing some stuff and how LeBron talked to, to every, you know, every person that he walked hmm. through in the arena, the, the attendants and, and the person, you know, the janitors walking through and, and just every, and I, I will never forget that. I thought that he, he was just being so kind and so polite to everyone in the arena. And it's things like that that I think stick with you in the I show. will say that LeBron, since he's had the spotlight on him since day one, and we all kind of expected him to be the next Jordan or the next great all-star, great NBA Hall of Famer since he was like 15 or 16 years old, Grew up in, in the spotlight in the fishbowl and has kind of risen through and kind of risen to expectations mostly. It's fairly amazing he's still f- kind of grounded. And I know you can't be completely grounded and completely normal, but every time I hear him speak or I've been around him in a locker room setting or what have you, he strikes me. I'm like, it's almost the most surprising thing about him is not how giant he is physically or how great he is at basketball. Is that he has a certain normalcy that is kind of impossible in that spot. I 100% agree. And I know, you know, there's a hate him and, or love him factor with him. But short of his the decision to go to Miami, which I think was maybe just misguided um, by a handful of people. Uh, but short of that, I, I can't think of one thing that he's done that's really struck me as, you know, what is this guy thinking? He's really full. You know, he, I think he's made smart business decisions. I think he's, you know, very good when it comes to things in the community. But but I do. I agree with you. I think for what he is, for what he's accomplished, for the track that he's on, I, I am always surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised by how humble he still seems. I think Kobe's a really interesting guy right now in his career because he is – seeing his mortality he's understanding his mortality right and so he's kind of he's now kind of more want to say anything that comes to his mind he's not tapering off he's not tempering his he's just saying exactly what he feels and he's a really smart guy so I kind of like that Kobe's in the screw everybody else mode I don't care I'm just gonna say what I want to say and do what I want to do and so, how does how does he come off in person? I, I think he's he's a little bit different. Um, you know, I think when we talk about people having an aura around them, he has an air about him, but but that's more of his personality. And you know, cocky, you could say. Um, but but that he he kind of owns who he is. And and you know, I'm not going to say that in dealings with Kobe and I never had a bad one, but that I'd say, oh, he's one of the, he's not one of the most humble people you're you're ever going to come across. He seems really guarded. He is, but but as you said, in in these later years, he kind of says what he thinks. He says what he wants. He's starting to get a little more unguarded. Yeah, and 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 you got to respect that, and you got to respect that in a player who's who's trying to figure out how they want to spend the end of their career. I mean, for him, yeah, I give him so much credit for coming back from that Achilles surgery and what he's done, and and just how he's playing this year. Um, but yeah, and that's why it is. It's so intriguing to see these professional athletes in different settings, and, and as you said, how they kind of start to face uh, the mortality of their career. I think Kevin Garnett is one person that jumps out to me in this last year, which he has not said it, but but I would assume will be his last year. He's in a phase of I'm going to have fun, mm. I'm going to relish it, it, mm. I'm going to enjoy it. Um, he obviously takes it seriously, but but there seems to be an edge uh, in a positive way that, that's off him a little bit. He's having a little bit more fun. But but just, you know, you think about this is this is what has been their life for so long. And, and when you get to that point where it may not be going on any longer, you're not playing any longer, um, you know, everyone deals with it differently. And I think for us as, as fans or as members of the media, it is intriguing to watch. Before I let you go, I want to ask you about a huge story last year that you were right in the middle of, and that was uh, the Jason Collins situation. Because yeah. he gets signed by the Nets yeah. and... Uh, he gets the standing ovation on the road in L.A., and then he gets the standing ovation at home. I was actually at that game with the Nets in Brooklyn, and it was a really kind of cool vibe and cool story, and I thought he handled himself well, and the Nets handled it really well. But it must have been crazy for you to be thrown in the middle of that. It was. It was. You bring that up. We were in Los Angeles uh, getting set to play the Lakers right. when that happened, and it was just it, it was just such a special day. And, and you can feel it. And I think uh, both the Nets and both Jason, they understood the magnitude of it. But they also at the same time wanted to make sure this is basketball. For the Nets, they, they said this is a basketball decision that's uh-huh. going to help us. Um, and, and for Jason, it was that had been his livelihood. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to get back on the court. It wasn't about necessarily being the first openly gay professional player. It's He wanted to play still. Right. Um, but, but it was just so cool to see, you know, that first day. But then also every other city we went to. 
it, it was a standing ovation mm. every time we went in the game and um, the media that would come. And, and what I appreciated most, it was celebrated. It wasn't questions mm, um, right. that, you know, they, they kind of got into the, to the uh, you know, the depths of it, but it was more a, a celebration of what it was. And I thought it was just really special to be a part of. Just thrown right in the middle of it for you. Just, <laughs> were just right in the middle of the blender. Add, add on, add on. No, it was fun. <laughs> it, was, it was such a cool thing. Well, let's see what the second half of the next season holds, but you got to stop by again now that we're no longer in the overnight. Hey, I, anytime, anytime. <laughs> we'll bring the I, Tostitos. I'll bring my, I was going to say, I'll bring, my, I'll bring my own food. Okay, we'll get the queso for you. You bring <laughs> whatever you want to dip in, okay? Sarah Kustak from the Yes Network joining us here in studio. Uh, we got some pictures that we'll post on our Facebook page and Twitter as well, so DA on CBS. Uh, also, our Facebook, facebook.com slash the DA show. And where can they follow you on Twitter, Sarah? Awesome. Thank you, Dana. Yep. Sarah Kustok on Twitter is at Sarah Kustok, K-U-S-T-O-K. You want your mothership spicy? A DA permission to be abducted by the mothership. Or original recipe? DA on CBS Sports Radio. Need new brakes? Find the brake parts. You need to know O'Reilly Auto Parts, brand that you trust. Brake best, brake best, select and Wagner Thermo Quiet. Guaranteed low prices. O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day. Look, I went to public school growing up, right through high school. So I know what a bunch of rats we could all be. A bunch of rug rats, just annoyance, annoyances and slackers and all types of trouble. Okay. My cousin, who is one of my best friends of the world, we grew up together, same age, same grade, same school, everything, played on the same teams together, everything growing up, became a public high school history teacher. And then eventually uh, moved into the athletic department. One of my aunts, public school teacher, and then principal forever. Forever, ever. Forever, ever, forever, ever. And everybody gets old quick working in public school. I know everyone says, well, you get summers off. It's easy and all that. Man, it's never easy. Never easy. And that's why this story is awesome to me. Let's just go back. Mraz, were you a troublemaker in, in high school? I know you went to a public school, too. I was a class clown. There's no doubt I was a class clown. Now, trouble, I would always get to the brink of trouble and kind of backpedal a little bit. But you were a headache to teachers. There's no question I was. So Harold Diamond of Wurtsboro, New York, which is probably an hour and a half outside of New York City or so. It's up in the sticks. Sullivan County, total sticks, because that's past where I grew up. Harold Diamond worked in public schools his entire life. He's 80 years old. He elevated himself to principal and then retired, I think, probably 15 years ago or so. He was an elementary school principal for 35 years. Principal for 35 years. In an elementary school. All sorts of flu walking in that place every day. Ugh. Okay, so when was the last time you were in an elementary school? Because I was, I just did a career day. Remember I did a career day last, right. last year at an elementary school? And the kids are great. They're a ton of fun. But, I mean, you can't get a word in edgewise. They're all screaming. They're all crying. They're all running. They're all sneezing. They're all every. They're doing anything but listening. Just sounds like a giant germ trap to me. Oh, it's a huge germ trap. And again, the kids are great and kids are adorable. But if you're trying to teach them anything or discipline, forget it. Especially now, forget it. 35 years. Elementary school principal. 35 years. This guy retires. He's 80 years old. Probably not a ton longer for him. Maybe, you know, hopefully he gets to 100. But, you know, he's on the back nine, very obviously. And... If you turn 80 after 35 years of an elementary school principal, that's kind of like dog years, probably about 95. How about this? Freaking 80-year-old Harold Diamond wins mega millions. says he bought the ticket at a highway service center where he had stopped at his wife's Carol's insistence because there was an election day storm and she asked him to please wait it out on the side of the highway. And so he waits out the storm. He bought 10 tickets for 10 10 bucks and put them in his wallet. He never checked to see if he had won 
until after hearing the winning ticket had been purchased at the same service center the next day when he was playing a round of golf, which I love at 80 years old, still going out and hacking. Love it. He says he put his ticket in his wallet and forgot about it. He played golf the next day, and the guys in the clubhouse were talking about the jackpot winning ticket somebody had bought at the Valero on Route 302. And I thought, wait a minute, I bought a ticket there last night at the Valero on Route 302. It was a $326 million ticket. It's about the money. (laughs) M-O-N-E-Y, D-A. $326 million, which comes to about $130 million after taxes. I don't even have a job, Damien. Doesn't need to work a day in his life, even when he retired. But now he is set and his family is set, and that's what you get. If you just put your head down, there's glory in the grind, and you deal with the snot-nosed seven-year-olds at elementary school for 35 years, Mraz, one day your wife will tell you, you know what, honey, just stay on the side of the road until the storm passes, then come home, I'll have meatloaf waiting for you, and you go and buy a ticket, and you don't even know you won, you don't even care that you won, you wake up the next day, and you're $130 million richer. That's the story. I hope that happens, but I hope I'm a heck of a lot younger than 80 so I can enjoy it. Oh, come on. I'm happy for the guy, but you know, part of me makes me feel like it's a wasted ticket a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, stop. What are you talking about? I, I'm happy for the guy, you but you know terrible. what? You're terrible. Let's be honest. He's he's not going to live another 25 years. Well, he might. He could get to 100. Well, triple you know what? Digits. Maybe with that money, he could pay his way to uh, Absolutely. You know, something could happen. But, yeah, I feel like, you know what? Let the money be won by the younger crowd. Oh, yeah, because you would know how to spend it better. I I'm, mean, s- I'm speaking on behalf of the youngies out there. The we young- deserve it, too. The youngies. You would build yourself a house built out of Tostitos. A house of pancakes. A house so you would literally have a house built of pancakes. I don't think any dry rot would happen there. Did this guy... Deserved. You should see the picture of this guy. He looks like the old tortoise from the Tootsie Roll Pop commercial. Tortoise in the tail. The tortoise in the tail. He is bald. He's got the big Coke bottle glasses. His beautiful wife is next to him. They are adorable. They are completely deserving. Steve O, I know you have at least a little bit of warmth in your heart. You have to love, I love this story. it. I love it. I think Mraz is completely off base here off saying base. that it's a waste. That's ridiculous. I mean, he's, he's maybe he has grandkids. Him. Come on, his he could give him away to his, his $130 yeah, I mean, million. Come on, this guy's hard work finally pays off. Good for him. 35 years as is a, is a elementary school principal? I mean, that's that's heavy lifting there. Well, now, principals are the only people that work hard across the country. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but you can't spell principal without P A L. Ah, if I heard that one more time. <laughs> I had a lot of real jerk principals my whole life. Maybe that's part of it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that is part of it. I think this is awesome. 855-212-4CBS, 855-212-4227. Hit us on Twitter as well, DA on CBS. My man Jose's next up. He's in Philly, WIP on 610. What's going on, Jose? What up? DA? What up, buddy? How are you, my man? Fine. What up, Moralia's? Moralia is nodding to you. Oh. What up, Jose? <laughs> Not for much. What up, Raz? What up, Jose? Not for much. Can I... Slap it up on the mothership, yo. Yeah, slap it up. <laughs> slap it Thanks, up. yo. Yeah, you got it, yo. Thanks. Let's get to the business. Number one on the national championship. Yeah. I went on social media. I went on Facebook. I was crying for Oregon's defense to stop Ezekiel Elliott on the ground. The man winds up going for another 200-yard game and four touchdowns. You got that right, buddy. And I'm like, stop this. Cat, man, stop this guy. Had no answer. Couldn't tackle him with three ducks. You could put a ducks on the pond and he'll run and he ran by it. He could run by ducks in a pond. Yep. And um, second of all, it looks like Urban got himself a QB problem. He's got three quarterbacks coming back. Yeah, that's a good problem to have. And um, maybe me and you could just go to Columbus and uh, try out for QB spots next year. No, I don't think there's any spots left for us. <laughs> I know. That's why there's only three. Yeah, well. And I think, as a Michigan fan, yeah. if I have to see Ezekiel Elliott for at least two more seasons, he may be a first-round pick in the foreseeable future. Well, if running backs still were first-round commodities, I mean, he was, a, he was a man amongst boys last night. Now, I don't know how he's going to end up evolving as a college back, but 
last night was one of those games for the ages. We've had, we've had a couple of monster ground games. Remember what Nick Chubb just did a couple of weeks back in his bowl game? I mean, remember Trey Mason in the SEC title game? We've had a couple of kind of monster, crazy, beast mode efforts from running backs, and last night, definitely one of them. And the single season or the single game rushing record fell twice in what, the span of a week and a half? Amazing this year. Mike's next up. He's in California, listening to 970. What's up, Mike? Hey, I was just listening to you talk about the social studies teacher and education for years. That's I'm a social studies teacher. Okay. And um, I just got home from wearing a costume as Father O'Flanagan, a monastery monk, and teaching the Middle Ages, and had a great time today. Oh, very good. All right. How, did, how was your acting performance? Would it have gotten a Golden Globe? No, not at all. It's wow. Scottish, Celtic, Gaelic, Irish. It's a mix. That's but a hey, lot. that's a lot. Um, I, I have a captive audience. <laughs> yeah, right. N- nonetheless, I enjoy what I do. You know, and I get I get paid enough to to uh, have time off with my family, and it's the best job I've ever had. My question is, why would a ninety year old want to even invest into the lottery? I'm I'm assuming he had a great life and he's had a great job. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me that he would like need millions of dollars that, you know, I wouldn't mind having myself. Well, I don't think he needs the millions of dollars. Like I said, the story is, look at this guy, man. Mike, the social studies teacher, is talking about how great his life is. Oh, my God, I love my job. It's so wonderful. You know, I get to dress up in all these characters, but I want the million dollars. Why did that old geezer get to win it? You know, real nice, real nice. Why can't you just be happy for the guy? You know, wish good on others and good will happen to you. Here's what happened. Old guy is not 90, he's 80, all right? And 80 is not dead. 80 is the new 40. 80 is the new, it's the new 78 at least. At least. At least. So he's driving home. His wife calls him. I'm assuming that he has a cell phone. His wife says, honey, I don't want you driving to the storm. I want you to pull over. Just take it easy. Take your time. He goes, okay, honey, I will. There's a Valero gas station on the side of the highway. So he pulls off, and he hangs there for a little bit. Okay, I'm assuming he gets himself a coffee or something. Maybe he's thumbing through one of the the magazines, one of the fashion magazines. Maybe it's through Us Weekly. He's checking out who wears it best. And he says, all right, I got some time. Or more like, I got some time. He says, let me just throw 10 bucks down on some mega millions. I mean, what do I got to lose? I'm 80 years old. It's all win anyway. I got a beautiful wife at home. We're happy. We're healthy. I'm retired. I'm going to play golf tomorrow. So he puts 10 bucks down. He gets 10 $1 tickets for Mega Millions. Doesn't even care about it. Puts them in his pocket. Next day, he hears all the guys at the clubhouse who he's golfing with talking about how it was won at the Valero down the street. And he's like, wait a second. I bought that ticket. He looks. He's like, I won that. He wasn't saving up. Oh, my God. I need the lottery. That's what's great about this story. I think it's awesome. Everyone's acting like 80 is dead. Come on, man. I think 80 is the new 70. 78, I think, is a little bit too much. I mean, think about modern medicine these days. 80 is the new 70. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. He's got a long time, and with all that money, he'll be able to push 110. 110, yeah. I mean, certainly triple digits. No doubt about it. Unless, you know what? And God bless him if he does this. He takes the money and just goes crazy, popping bottles on yachts. He starts going skydiving, you know, rock climbing, all this great stuff because he has all this money now. And then your heart might explode at 82. But, hey, you lived it up. Can't take it with you. And let your kids and grandkids win their own lottery. (laughs) That's what I say. (laughs) All right. New time slot. Say mothership. Hey, DA, used to bring me in to work every morning. I need permission to board the mothership. (laughs) Well, come aboard, buddy. DA on CBS Sports Radio. 43 minutes past the hour. Thanks for being with us. DA with you here on the ever-expanding CBS Sports Radio Network. Triple H is going to join us. One of the superstars of the WWE for a long time. Now an executive with them. He's going to join us coming up here. At about 20 past the hour, so stand by for that. 855-212-4CBS. 855-212-4227.
The Milwaukee Brewers have rolled out the timeless ticket. Timeless ticket. All right, so the timeless ticket is a bronze personalized ticket, which kind of looks like a statue, okay, like a little statue or a paperweight you could put on your desk. Personalized. And that timeless ticket is good for any Brewers game ever. Ever. Any game ever. You want opening day? You got it. You want game seven of the World Series? You got it. Now, factor in that it's a Brewers ticket, and you might not be holding your breath for Game 7 of World Series. But this ticket's good for whenever, wherever. Whenever you want to use it and cash it in, you got it. The only catch is it's $1,000. It's about the money. M-O-N-E-Y-D-A. I already see you rolling your eyes, Mraz. You do not like the timeless ticket, I, I take it? Sounds like a giant scam to me. How so? Well, A, it's clever how you get a timeless ticket for 1000 bucks, but you can only redeem it for one ticket. So what? You got to go sit by yourself like you're Steven Glansberg out in the bleachers <laughs> to the World <laughs> Series game? You, don't even, you can't even bring a buddy? That's number one. Okay, fair. N- number two... First of all, we're all compulsive now. You're going to be sitting there, and you're going to have this timeless ticket for five years. The Brewers aren't going to go to a World Series. You're going to be maybe down on your luck. You're dying for something to do on a hot July day, and you're going to go blow the thing and go to a Brewers-Cardinals game and not have the willpower to hold out and use it for a World Series ticket, and they know there's enough people out there that are going to do that, and they just flushed $1,000 down the toilet. Ward, does this not sound like it's coming from a man that has absolutely zero willpower when it comes to a lot of things, including dinner? <laughs> I was just thinking Sean was relating it to, like, the <laughs> secret ice cream that you save for emergency situations when inevitably it's gone within 24 hours. I, 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 calm down. You could just see, like, some some guy living in his mom's basement who got this, you know, as a birthday gift from all his relatives pulled in, sitting there basically looking to pawn this thing off somewhere. I mean, come on. This is a scam. All right. $1,000 does seem like a lot of money. What the Brewers admitted was... That $1,000, they had to factor into account Game 7 of the World Series. And that in a secondary market last year in Kansas City, a relatively sized uh, market, kind of like Milwaukee, that if the Brewers got to Game 7 of a World Series like the Royals did, that it would be about $1,000. So it would be worth your time. The problem is the Royals had to wait nearly 30 years to get to a World Series. And the Brewers have been waiting since 1982. And see, that's the other thing. You say the Brewers finally get to a World Series, you're a lifelong Brewer fan, you wait. Yeah. You're going to cross your fingers and hope they get to a Game 7? You're going to go to Game 1. Well, that's true. Okay, and so here's why the 1000 bucks to me didn't quite pass the smell test. Because for 1000 bucks, you just wait to see if they make it to a World Series. You don't need the guarantee. 1000 bucks is going to get you in the door. It might not get you a great seat, but it's going to get you in the door. I have friends in Kansas City I used to work there uh, that got to Royals playoff games for 500 bucks. 400 bucks. They got to World Series games for 600 bucks. Seven. If you wanted to spend 1000, you'd get to a World Series game. There's almost no World Series game ever that $1000 wouldn't get you in. I suppose a game 7 at, at Fenway, like if we got to a game 7 and the Cubs had it at Wrigley, you probably couldn't get to the door for 1000 bucks. But almost any other World Series game you could, even if it was the Brewers and they hadn't been there in a long time. So it kind of seemed like a rip. But here's where it makes sense. Because they've added now, you get nine more timeless tickets that can't be used in the playoffs, but for any regular season game, excluding opening day. Now I realize you want to go to opening day, but let's say that you buy the timeless ticket for a grand, okay? And let's say you want to use it on one great run. You could have nine home games in September and then use this for a playoff game. And that makes far more sense. Don't you think, I mean, if this was worth 10 games to you, don't you think that's better? Don't you think that's worth the grand? Again, $1,000 is a lot of money in this day and age. I don't care how you cut it. But, Mariah, if I could get you to 10 games, even if only one of them's the postseason, I think that's worth it. Yeah, but again, I, I go to StubHub quickly here. Chicago Cubs hot ticket this year with Joe Madden in Milwaukee weekend in May when you figure both teams are in it. You get in the door for 25 bucks. 
Come on. It's not like brewer tickets are $200 a pop here. <laughs> Give me a break. But, and you know when you redeem it, they're not putting you behind home plate. <laughs> You're sitting up there in the right field upper decks, you know, hoping you have binoculars to see Bernie the Brewers slide down. <laughs> Give me a break. It's a scam. <laughs> I don't think it's a scam. It's, it's a, a scam. Here's what I here's what I would I would say. It's fascinating because when do you use it? Right? How do you use it? When do you use it? Let's say you're a Yankee fan. You can hold out for a game seven of World Series. Well, you used to be able to. I don't know about it. If you're a Giants fan, if you're a San Francisco Giants fan, a Cardinals fan, you know, you could hold out. If you're only in the NLCS, you don't need to you don't need to play that card. NLDS, don't have to play that card. Me as a Mets fan, you know. Division round, I might have to play that card. If we get to the, <laughs> the one game wild card, I might have to play that card, right? I can't I can't wait forever for a World Series. If you're a Cubs fan, you cannot wait for the World Series. Uh, but if you're a Brewers fan and you can plunk it down game seven NLCS, do you do it? Or do you say no because then it would mean we would lose, and because I could use this in the World Series. Anyway. I think here's the thing: if you've made it all the way to Game Seven in the NLCS, you know, basically you're playing deal or no deal, and, and putting down the box saying no deal, because at that point you've waited that long. You might as well see if we get to a World Series. Here. But you could be watching a clincher, and you haven't been to the World Series since '82. You could watch them clinch. But you want to get in the big dance, then that's when you play no deal. And this is why they know this is what's going to happen. There's going to be too many people that can't take the anxiety, bail out. They're at a game versus the Reds in August. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can use it forever, though. I know. So you I don't know. have to use it in August against the Reds. And then you're going to get a lot of people who have these things who turn into hypochondriacs. Think they're getting sick. I don't know how much <laughs> longer I got. I got to get to a game here. See, I, I think it's pretty cool because you would kind of have it sitting next to your TV as this kind of um, this voodoo doll staring at you die. Right? It's like you know you could go to any game forever, and you're holding out for Game Seven of the World Series. And it's just taunting you every single day you watch that team lose. Exactly. There's no doubt. And you're probably going to be sitting there. I bet you the Brewers win 60 games the next 10 years just to curse everybody that bought these things. <laughs> You'd freak out. You'd have anxiety. You wouldn't be able to take it. Then you know what? Life throws you curveballs. Let's say you have this thing. You've waited five years. Next thing you know, something happens with a job. Family has to pick up and move. And what do you do then? I think you're jaded as a Yankees fan. You've seen a lot of World Series. You've seen a lot of ALCSs. I, have, I think I you're have. jaded. I think you're jaded because... You say there's no big deal to Game 7 of the ALCS or NLCS. I think there is. I think being there to clinch going to the World Series is awesome. I think That's in probably fa- fair. Game 7 of the, world, of the ALCS or the NLCS is probably better than being at Game 2 of the World Series. Well, I, Probably true, but let's not act like most Brewer fans aren't Packer fans and haven't seen their share of winning, too. You know, maybe a different sport, but they've seen winning over there. So it's not like this is, like, you know, something obscure. Ward, scam or no scam, the $1,000 timeless ticket from the Brewers. I think it's a cool idea. You're buying, but I'm also I also see one of the guys you know buying the the thousand dollar golden ticket and redeeming it for like Greg Vaughn bobblehead day in May. <laughs> like, oh, I really want to go to this. There's going to be somebody that panics. There's going to be somebody sitting there with not a lot of money, you know, living off unemployment. He's got his buddies with good jobs. They're looking to get to a game, and you come on, bro, you got to go. You got that thing from your grandmother, man. Let's go to the game. Let's get to the game. And he goes, he gets peer pressure and goes, all right, let's go. Then the Brewers go get rocked 10-1 to the Astros, and then what? Then it's all out. You know, I... What is this, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, by the way? But let me just tell you this. It's not actually the worst buy in the world. And I know you say 25 bucks to go see Reds and uh, or Cubs and, and Brewers. Remember, the Falcons are charging $45,000 for a PSL for the right to buy season tickets. For the right to buy season tickets. So you could buy 45 timeless tickets and go see the Brewers of the World Series 45 times for the price of one opportunity to buy Falcon season tickets. Well, that's true. And the Falcons better make those seats made of, you know, gold. Uh, that's ridiculous. Or Willy Wonka chocolate. But bottom line is this: Brewers, we're on to you. What a scam you have going! I would totally buy it if I had a thousand dollars and was a Brewers fan. Frank is next up. He's in the Bronx. He's listening on WFAN dot com. What's going on, Frank? Let me jump aboard, please. You got it, buddy. Uh, I I think a thousand bucks is uh, that's well worth it. I would do it. You're taking the timeless ticket right there. I spent a thousand dollars on a Yankee game and they stink. Okay, right, fair enough. I mean, you know, that's just the way it is. If you want to go to something, you got to go to. It. But that's a pretty good deal, and I could see it by uh, July. Somebody trading it in for a Met Met Cup game or something. <laughs> pretty sad world we live in. That's right. 
Hey, so I wanted to talk a little about the Knicks and, and uh, thinking about Stoudemire and thinking that if we unload him, you know, what do you think we're getting back besides Trump and his contract? Any picks? Is that possible? Uh, I don't know if you could get a first rounder, Frank. I, I think with the way Amari Stoudemire has totally deteriorated over the last couple of years um, because of how onerous the contract is, knowing that the Knicks are going to get out from under it after the season, the Knicks don't have to just trade it. But I also don't think it has much value. It's an expiring contract, but the Knicks don't want to take on other contracts, right? And so what do they? why do the Knicks even need to trade it at this point? You're just kind of eating the rest of the season. You're already almost $10 million out from under it for this year. You've only got about $10 million left to spend on it, to pay out on it for the rest of the season since we're midway through the year. And after that, it's you're fine. You're gold, and then you, you have that, that cap space. The question is, can they really resign anybody? Does anybody want to come to the dumpster fire that is the Knicks? But I don't think you're going to get a one for it. I mean, maybe you can get a second-round draft pick, and maybe that's all that the Knicks want. But because Amari is worth nothing, you're just trading the contract. He can't go anywhere and really help a contender, not at this point in time with his knees, especially if it's worth $10 million. So maybe a two... Very doubtful a one, and maybe the Knicks just kind of eat it. Well, as I was saying, when I was listening to the radio, I heard something. And what did you hear? A uh, hissing sound like this. Hey, T.A. Hey, D.A. Let me aboard that mothership. Permission to board that mothership, sir. Well, you know, I had to slide through the intergalactic swag party. D.A., man, beam me up. <laughs> What's going on, my brother from another mother? Beam me up. You guys are the best. You guys make it. Permission to board that mothership. What's up, D.A., brother? All right, man. Mothership has connected. Are you the man, DA? Happy Thursday to you, North America. The mothership has connected. Welcome aboard the nightly four-hour cosmic cocktail party. DA with you from the CBS Sports Radio Studios in New York City, broadcasting to nearly 160 radio affiliates nationwide and north of the border. Baltimore to Anchorage, Salt Lake to Orlando, Kalamazoo, and Waterloo. We are on the air. Are they listening, DA? Everything we say in DA, everything. Coming your way tonight here on the show, UFC President Dana White. Big card coming up this weekend on Sunday. Big days in Boston this weekend. Sunday evening, Patriots and Colts from Foxborough AFC Championship game. Later on that night in Boston, you've got UFC fight night from the TD Garden. So Dana White's going to join us. Also, head coach of the number 21 Seton Hall, Pirates. Kevin Willard's going to drop on by the Pirates have had a couple of very important wins of their season, knocking off two top 15 teams back-to-back. St. John's to the number six Villanova. So the Pirates are in the top 25. We'll talk to their head coach, Kevin Willard, later on in the show. Holler at me, 855-212-4CBS, 855-212-4227. On Twitter, DA on CBS. Let's begin with the crowning quarterback of the national championship game, Cardell Jones, who could have been eligible for the NFL draft. He is now three years removed from the his high school days, coming off a brilliant final three games of the season, the whitewash 59-0 of Wisconsin in the Big Ten title game, the win over highly ranked and highly favored Alabama, and then the win in the national championship game over favored Oregon. Cardell Jones calls a press conference. So if you call a press conference, you're declaring for the NFL draft. Who could blame him? It was a Cinderella run, and if he can cash in, he can cash in. Not so fast. Cardell Jones decides to return for his junior season in Columbus. It's where we begin. It's your cold open. My decision was very simple. You know, after talking over my family, my friends, uh, my coaching staff, I'm going to return next year for school. Thank all you guys for coming out. I mean... I don't know why you guys made it such a big deal, but <laughs> I mean, like I said, it was very simple for me, man. It, the NFL after three games was really out of the question for me. I mean, yeah, it was a little doubt because, like I said, that when the opportunity presented itself to me, I mean, 
Of course, you know, I want to play in the NFL, but I want the time to be right. He's very, very smart. I've been very impressed with this kid. An incredible night. I don't believe it. The most amazing, sensational, dramatic, hard running. Here's the headline of the night. Here he goes. It's DA's cold open. Cold. Even to a guy like me, that's cold. That was Cardell at the press conference. And what I liked hearing from him was after three games, it was kind of out of the question to go to the NFL. And that's the reality. While he had a tremendous three games, while he went 3-0, and he averaged about 250 yards per game through the air, while he showed poise and maturity, big play capability, he could move that team into the red zone and then the end zone and didn't turn the football over, it was three games. Again, you couldn't blame him if he was cashing in the winning lottery ticket, even if he was projected to be a third-round draft pick. You know what? You stick around. You back up Braxton Miller, JT Barrett, or both of them. You might not start again in college. You might never get drafted again. So you could have made a couple of hundred thousand dollars, or you come back and you kind of spin the wheel, or you come back and you get injured. You know, there's a lot of different things that could have happened. But I'm glad that the perspective was not, hey, I'm worried about coming back and not getting my money. I'm glad the perspective was it's only three games. Because that is the reality. It was only three games. What's kind of amazing is that he's not guaranteed to be the starter at Ohio State. You know? He's going to have to battle. He's going to have to compete. And maybe he'll be it. Maybe he won't. But if he was going to come back, I I think this decision is a lot easier if he's absolutely the go-to number one starter leading a program. The fact that you're just going to be in the mix, one of three, could be very daunting. But I appreciated that. I do think, I think it's kind of interesting and funny that Jones said, I don't know why you guys made a big deal out of this. He was the one that called the press conference. I mean, he didn't need the press conference. Could have just released a statement. But either way. It showed some big picture thinking and mature thinking. And at least somebody around him, whether it's Urban Meyer, whether it's his family, whether it's him himself, whatever it is, going, hey, at the end of the day, it's three games. At the end of the day, it's only three games. And I'm not quite ready for that step. And it's important, I think, for young men that have been given celebrity and attention and a lot of things in their life, like our athletes here in the United States are, when they're playing AAU or they're playing high school football or basketball or whatever it is, youth sports, amateur sports, hockey, soccer, baseball, whatever it is, we're going to push them through and tell them how great that they are and they're playing in front of crowds. We try to take care of them and put them in a bubble and they're told how awesome they are all the time. Rarely does grounding come into play. Grounding and reality need to happen. And when a young man goes, it's only three games. It wasn't even really an option. You like hearing that. It is, though, ironic. Let's say this, because Cardell Jones is infamous for one of the more viral tweets of the last calendar year. You might remember Cardell Jones not long ago tweeted, why should we have to go to class if we came here to play football? We ain't come to play school. Classes are pointless. And that got retweeted about 14 million times and talked about ad nauseum. I don't know what changed between from there until now because it sounds like a guy that (laughs) would rather just play football and not worry about the classes. But hey, maybe a guy's perspective can change. Maybe the guy just goes, this college thing's pretty good, especially if I don't have to go to class. And now having won the national championship, I never have to go to class. (laughs) Cardell Jones was the poster boy for the athlete that has no interest in education. And now he's like, I'm going to come back to school. I like it around here. I guess everything can change a little bit when you're a defending national champion. You're a hero on campus and you'll be a legend forevermore in Columbus and the state of Ohio. Cardell Jones is going back to school. 855-212-4CBS. 855-212-4227. Hit us on Twitter as well, DA on CBS. What's most funny about this to me is that during the course of the national championship game, 
I was getting tweets from Mraz about what type of man crush he had on Cardale Jones. That this was this was his guy. This was the leader of his the New York Giants once Eli was going to be out the door. Mraz wanted Cardale Jones right there. Under center. He was your guy. You must have been heartbroken to find this out today. No, I'm happy with it because, you know what, we still have Ryan Nassib. We weren't going to take him in the second and third round. This gives us a year or two to play with and see what happens with Eli if we make that pick. Why did you have such a crush on Cardale? You, listen, you can't teach 6'5 with a cannon. The way he stands in there and delivers the ball, there's certain guys you just watch. And I know because I've seen a lot of championship football as a Giant fan. Oh, listen to To this. know the kind of guy that could deliver the goods <laughs> and Cardale Jones could deliver the goods. All right. After three games, you knew that. Three big games. He won three championships. He won three championship games. Well, he won a conference championship and then a bowl game and then yeah. the national championship game. Could you consider the Sugar Bowl a championship game? It's a don't you get a ring for winning it? I don't know. Do you? I think you do. I think he's got three rings now. He's got a Big Ten ring, a Sugar ring, and a national championship ring. I know you didn't watch the Big Ten title game. Well, 59 nothing. Safe to say I tuned out <laughs> if there was 7 nothing. Joe is in Mississippi. He's listening on 103.1. Hello, Joe. Hey, how y'all doing today, man? Good, my man. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. That uh, tweet that he sent out kind of nullified my comment that I was going to make. I was kind of hoping that the young man would have been more interested in finishing his education. But, uh, well, he sent out no that class thing, you know. He sent out that, that tweet crazy. a couple of months ago. So who knows? Maybe he changed his mind. Well, yeah. Yeah, you know. Uh, guy has a work, way of working with all of us. But, um, you know, I just wanted to say I, I am glad to see that he did decide to come back because, like you say, three games is, is no kind of preparation for the NFL. Um, you know, as talented as he is, as big as he is. But, uh, yeah, another year, maybe even two more years. And like you said earlier, without even the possibility of knowing he's a starter, it would be uh, good for him to come on back. That's what you have to appreciate about it is that he's not coming back with the job guaranteed to him. He's coming back to compete for the job and try to defend the job. And, you know, you got to give him credit here. But, again, the reality is, just as you said, Joe, it's only three football games. And for as great as he played, his teammates also played great. And his coach was also great. And I think it's the right reality. I mean, you have a guy like Maurice Claret who is going, he's making the right decision. Maurice Claret realized what a mistake it was for him to come out early. And again, I don't begrudge guys that want to go get paid because if I was a sophomore in college and somebody said, D.A., you are guaranteed a radio job, it's worth a million and a half bucks, and you don't have to graduate, you can go back and get your degree sometime else, but here's your job, you're coming out, it'd be hard for me to say no. How could I say no? I don't begrudge a young man for going out and getting that cash, but far too often those guys are not ready, and I would say I wouldn't have been ready either. But specifically after three games, it's hard to figure you are ready for the perils of what awaits you in the NFL after just three games. Frank's next up. He's in Iowa listening on 1490 there. What's going on, Frank? Not much. I got uh, something to say about this. this uh, I, I'm terrible with names. The gentleman that's got a man crush on this guy after just three games. Yes, that's How producer many, Sean Mraz. That's Mraz. Well, producer needs to wake up a little bit. How many yeah. college players that have been hyped up have been total bombs in the last four or five years? It's just three games. Let him see if he can handle a season. And see, let's see what he does after this next year in college to see how good of he is. If he's a good player, a great player, he'll continue the charge. If not, He'll blow like a bubble. I mean, it just blow up like a bubble. It just this is way too soon to judge how great of a player he is. Anybody can do almost anything in three games. Do it's you the long haul of seventeen games for a season that they have to concern themselves with? So you would say that the credibility of producer Mraz is totally shot in your mind. Oh, big time! If he's going to flip out over just three games, it doesn't matter. I mean, anybody can have a good series. I mean, shoot, even in bowling, I can get three strikes in a row. But do I get a perfect game? Never. And three strikes is a turkey. Yeah. I mean, I get turkeys once in a while all the time, but do I get a perfect game? I've never had a perfect game in my life, and I've been bowling for 30 years. Would you characterize Mraz's opinions as one of a bozo or a total dope? 
I would just say uh, total butterflies in the eyes, kind of not thinking, no common sense, no rationality type mindset. So, <laughs> so kind of, kind of like a gobbling idiot. Yeah, kind of like a guy that's just slathering. You know like how you get this Homer Simpson slathering over a steak kind of look? Yeah. I kind of think that's what your producer has over this player. Believe me, I've seen him slobber over some steaks. <laughs> You're right about that. All right, thank you, Frank. You take care. Okay, buddy. Sorry, Mraz. You have now ruined your credibility all over the state of Iowa. I can't believe the folks in Dubuque uh, can't stand me. I'm <laughs> slobbering like Homer Simpson. That's right. By the way, okay, who said he's going to have a perfect career? And... It's not like he went out there and and beat, you know, Las Vegas Tech. He beat Wisconsin. He beat Alabama. He beat Oregon. Could we stop acting like it was just three games? Because all these other college players that have one big year and come out, guess what? They play, you know, whatever, 14 games. And how many wins do they have versus teams that good? Probably the same amount, three. Yeah, but it was. It's a three-week stretch, essentially. I mean, it's it's basically a one. It's five-week stretch because they had a few weeks off. But, I mean... You're talking about he was very good at his football for five weeks, for, for a little more than a month. It's the eye test. The guy's got a cannon. He stands in there at 6'5". You cannot teach that. On November the 15th, you had no idea who Cardell Jones was. Today, you want the Giants to take him with a second-round pick. There's no doubt. <laughs> and that's credibility for well, you. Then you're nuts. I'm not nuts. I'm not nuts. You mark my words. Five years from now, we're going to be talking about, man, how many Super Bowls is Cardell Jones going to win? Is it too early? Oh, my God. I can't believe you just said that. I'm serious. <laughs> how many I love su- this guy. How many Super Bowls Cardell Jones is going to win? This guy is the best-looking <laughs> qu- college quarterback to come out since Luck. Oh, my God. Not to come God. out, but yes. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry. I'm You're sticking not- to it. Are I don't care how serious? insane. I-, I know I sound insane. There's just something that clicks when I watch this guy, and I know he's got the goods. He's the best college quarterback that's come out or that would come out since Andrew Luck? In my opinion, just straight up raw talent-wise, not on, you know, resume. I'm talking about raw talent, watch him play. Is Mraz nuts is your question of the night.